we'll get to cell phones in a second too. Um, but the basic premise was that at this time period, the 1850s, there was a phenomena of slaves just trying to get away from the plantations, and the whites couldn't really think of like, why would you want to not work in the plantation? Um, so what they ended up doing was studying people who wanted to be free. And so they would uh, say, well, why do you want to be free? You know, so they, they, it actually became an entire branch of psychiatry called drapetomania. And um, so this is like the earliest kinds of ideas of pseudoscience. The Nazis then took uh, other directions about criminals and measurements of the skulls and all sorts of stuff. But um, at, at its time, uh, they actually tried to quantify and figure out the urge to freedom. And um, I always find that quite amusing because you know, imagine you're, you're you know, slaving away in a hot you know, plantation, picking cotton or something, and you're like, you know, this sucks, I want to get the hell out of here. And they're like, wait a second, he's crazy. So, um, you know. <laughs> so the entire branch of psychiatry at that time, we literally started to try and quantify the urge to freedom. Um, so as we fast forward to 2019, it's a really fascinating moment because social media, as we know, um, has a different kind of uh, sort of economics at home. It's not the rural agrarian economics of the South, it's the attention economy. It's an idea that your app or your social media is an addiction engine. Um, and uh, the plantation, uh, the museum up, is of the mind. So, to me at least, right now, how we look at the arts is one of these areas where um, social sciences, the idea of quantification, and above all, data sciences all have converged in the form of mobile devices that I'm sure many of us all have in our pockets. So can I ask everybody a quick question? How many of you have a phone, just out of curiosity? Yeah, 100%. Uh, and then let's break the demographics down a little bit. Oh, one, one person, no phone. Okay, 98.9. Thank you for waiting <laughs> point one. Point um, so from that demographic, you all are probably highly educated, college, uh, so on and so on, credit ratings, mortgages, quantification, you know, we can go down the rabbit hole there. Um, now, of this demographic, how many have an iOS device, like Apple-esque? All right, and then how many have an Android, out of curiosity, okay? But that's about global. On the opposite, most of the third world is um, Android, and most of the first world is iOS, so those are kind of issues, first world problems, you know, so. So, what I wanna do today is unpack some issues from a couple of projects that engage some of those issues around how often we look at this idea of the interdisciplinary arts as a sort of a template for rethinking both science and the idea of the possible. Now, amazingly enough, you know, arts are different ways of rethinking what potentialities exist. For example, um, let's go to one of my favorite examples. I'm gonna take you to 1502. Um, this is a map drawn by Leonardo da Vinci. Now, in 1502, um, he came up with a form that we now call a technographic uh, representation. It basically, it's putting a perpendicular point of perspective on a map um, that essentially you can then use as if you're in a stable vector above the landscape. So that reshaped our ideas of how cartography would intersect, actually amusing enough, with warfare, because this was commissioned by the Borgia family. Um, anyone who's seen the TV series of Borgias, I mean, these guys weren't playing. And of course, uh, Machiavelli wrote his famous book, The Prince, uh, in reference to some of these guys in the Medici. But, but they were at war, so this was a, a tool of war. Um, and it was a better map to give uh, the um, Cesare, I'm never sure if the name was Italian, correct me, Cesare Borgia. Borgia a better perspective of the city's defenses. Um, now, as we fast forward to 2019, amusingly enough, this is the same place from Google Maps. And what's fascinating is that at that 500 year leap was a radical transition of perspective, but above all, the idea of, the idea of potential without the technology. Um, at that time, uh, he obviously, Leonardo da Vinci did not have satellites. So here we are in the 21st century where many of the tools and technologies have been imagined by uh, preceding eras, and then repurposed to actual tool sets that we often use in a very specific methodology. So, amusingly enough, going from 1502 to, to 2019, um, the huge gulf of different technologies and methodologies that allow uh, da Vinci's ideas and visions uh, to become a part of our technological landscape still comes from a sense of warfare. Um, I want to go back to this. This is Sputnik. Now, in 1957, the Soviets launched the Sputnik uh, in, the, in the heart of the Cold War. And amusingly enough, it was the first sound heard around the world. Um, at that time, it was a, what you call a telemetry signal. And it was just a simple bleep, 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 bleep. I'm sure anyone out there has probably heard that. It's part of the sort of basic DNA of the 20th century. But um, that caused a huge scientific shock. 
And what ended up happening is the Americans then sent up um, uh, satellites, the Explorer, uh, by um, you know all sorts of folks, like AKA Van Allen, you know, which ended up discovering the Van Allen belts, uh, which ended up helping us think about more electromagnetic spectrum around the planet. And then above all, the way of now, of course, we fast forward again to 2019 to GPS and other systems that are implicit and embedded in your phone. So there's an implicit and explicit logic uh, to how these systems work as they unfold in society. So to me at least, uh, many of the issues we've been seeing today are we're, we're looking at this crossroads of how um, the imaginary use of things, the imaginary itself, um, is under kind of a, an erosion in the era of social media, where this idea of the, the quantified self, how we look at the metrics of your everyday life and likes or clicks and you know, so on, um, have created a different kind of economy. Um, some people are calling it the attention economy, uh, other people like Richard Florida, who wrote a really good book called The Rise of the Creative Class, are calling it the creative economy. But it still goes back to this kind of eerie sensibility at the edge of both warfare and perspective. And of course, if we look at 1989, when the uh, Berlin Wall fell, uh, when, and the Soviet Union sort of vanished into the lexicon of imaginary nations, um, one could argue that the Cold War didn't really end, it just remixed, um, of course, with Putin and Trump and so on. Um, so, you know, that is a remix, right? Yeah. So, um, to me as an artist, it's really fascinating because you can really think about um, technologies and the imaginary uh, uses that we put them to from the perspective of how art always is at the edge of what's possible but still gives people a pathway to think about things. So, this is another example I'd love to bring up. Um, this is the studio of Luigi Russolo, who um, wrote a book called Atti di Romore in 1915. Um, basically, it was called The Art of Noise. And he said, in the future, everyone's going to listen to music out of these kinds of speakers. And again, at that time, it was a highly controversial statement. Uh, there were riots. Uh, people threw bottles at them. So you can almost consider it the original punk rock. <laughs> <laughs> and so their idea was to simulate the entire city in accelerated sound. Um, so from everything from the Avengers movies on over to all the loudspeakers you see around us, you can easily see who won. So the fun part about this is that not only was this a technological kind of sensibility, but it was still lyrical. There was a sense of play, and above all, the potentiality of the project. Um, for me, at least as an artist, these things kind of linger over my ideas structures. Um, and as Cynthia kindly pointed out, this is one of my more recent books. It's called The Book of Ice. And basically, I took a studio to Antarctica um, and carried a backpack for about six weeks and went to several of the main ice fields and ended up um, you know, this is very much not New York. <laughs> um, but the idea was to hit the reset button on my creative process as an artist and to challenge myself uh, looking at climate data from a subjective point of view. Um, basically, I worked with a group of climate scientists and did a series of studies of the different qualities of ice uh, under different temperature differentials. So, for example, what you're seeing here is a huge glacier shield that's at the precipice of what you call Kalvin, the Kelvin, C A L V I N G. But if you zoom in a little more, you can see geologic activity where the entire side of a mountain is being scraped away. And in fact, most of this region of the country, including the Great Lakes, was actually scraped by the geologic movement and the retreat of the glaciers. So we can easily see that kind of action, but in fast forward in a type of geologic fast forward motion. Um, and it looked like a nuclear bomb had gone off, in fact. Uh, the entire landscape was these huge ripples. But then also you realize that it also looks like sound waves. And so for me, at least, there was a kind of uh, a sensibility about sound, science, and above all, the way we look at pattern recognition. So whatever you think of ice, um, this is a kind of a chart showing how ice forms at different temperatures. Um, I worked with uh, Brian Green, who wrote a very uh, amazing bestseller called The Elegant Universe, um, and he's the head of the New York Science Festival. If you haven't been there, it's highly recommended. Um, and Brian wrote the introduction to the book, and then we also worked with Dartmouth's Cold Regions Research Labs to look at temperature differentials and the form of geometric uh, structures that ice would form. So whenever you see a piece of ice, there's a recursive logic at work. And so jumping from Leonardo da Vinci to another prototypical scientist, this gentleman, Johannes Kepler. Um, basically, Kepler in 1611 wrote an essay because he was on his way home in the middle of a snowstorm, and a, a snowflake landed on his sleeve, and he was shocked by the geometric precision of it. So he went home and wrote this essay called Six Sides of a Snowflake, which is generally considered to be the first mathematical treatise defining how these kinds of patterns in nature could be defined using very specific equations. Um, so the geometric form that you see when you look at ice 
actually, amusingly enough, it has a hexagonal shape that's folded in on itself over and over and over. So there's a kind of a stunning beauty in nature that actually is quite mathematical. And once you start thinking about that from the viewpoint of electronic music, you just think of it, everything as patterns. So when I was working on this project, uh, we took Johannes Kepler's equations and did what you call a data solidification, and I'll play some of that in a moment. But the fun part about it was the idea that na nature, math, and the everyday experience we all live are completely implicitly locked. Uh, one of my other favorite books when I was a kid was Gödel Escher Bach by Douglas Hofstetter, and that also kind of lingered over some of my memories when I was doing this project. Um, but once you get the basic formula for it, you can kind of start seeing that formula unfold in real time whenever you walk through a storm, you're kind of walking through pure mathematical sensibility. Um, now, of course, coming out of hip hop, I had to start thinking about some of the references from the urban culture that I come from. So this is Iceberg Slim. Um, Iceberg Slim was a highly influential hip hop poet or proto hip hop poet in the 60s. Um, and so there's a lot of people who call themselves Ice. You know, you got Ice Cube, Ice T. Uh, if you got the white guy, you got Vanilla Ice. <laughs> um, but he liked to kind of take photographs of himself sitting on huge piles of ice. Uh, and that was kind of his, his cool, you know. So Miles Davis, uh, you know, that the birth of the cool. Uh, there's a lot of these kind of reference points, but he was highly influential in the 60s as a poet. Um, and just a really fun, kind of dark book set in a kind of uh, quote unquote ghetto. Um, and really smart, really interesting. Also, he had a notorious haircut, we now call the Jerry Curl. Uh, but you don't do it, just avoid it. Um, but the fun part is here you have a sense of poetic lyrical quality and then the scientific quality. So how do you juggle those into a composition? So what I ended up doing was taking some of that, uh, the math from Johannes Kepler and applying it to Maxim SP software, which allows you to do pretty good data sonification, data visualization. Uh, we took some of the equations plugged it in and started generating um, some fractal sensibilities of the mathematics of the piece, it began generating more finer, uh, kind of re refined uh, versions of the equations, and it became more and more, uh, you know, sort of iterative. And finally, you actually get mathematically pure ice. Um, so intriguingly enough, that was just one component. And for me, at least, the idea here is, once you start thinking about geometry and sound, um, you can go back to the beginning of mathematics and music. Uh, the, the ancient Greeks, of course, we look at Pythagoras, Heraclitus. The idea of tuning the universe uh, was an implicit component of many of the tuning systems that we call you know, minor chord or major chord. Uh, for example, anyone who's in, studied music, you have the Phrygian, Lydian, Aeolian, all of these were different kind of chord structures that the ancient Greeks felt were it attenuate you to uh, kind of the mythologies of their time. Um, but for me, it's still grist for the materials that I use for sampling. So I sample data. Um, and I'm using that. This is a remix of Bush and Obama's face, for example. Um, you know, any kind of Photoshop of the mind. Um, and so the pun here is that once you have the kind of data set of any particular given, you can remix it. Um, so that makes the idea of an unstable narrative, an unstable subjective uh, engagement with the materials around you. Um, so the pun here is not only is there a sense of humor, but there's also an, an eerie sensibility about the instability of an object. Uh, if you look at most of Western culture for the last uh, thousand, two thousand years, uh, there's been this sort of fascination with permanence. Uh, for, you know, if you look at monuments, if you look at paintings, if you look at all sorts of stuff, this desire for permanence has sort of lingered over the entire discourse. But once things get digital, you have this notion that the impermanence of things, the acceleration of things, becomes the basic vocabulary. Um, so what we're looking at here is sort of a crisis of perspective. And again, going back to that Da Vinci kind of idea of looking at from above, perspective changes everything. So when I was working on that project, um, well, here's some of the temperature differentials we were looking at. Um, and again, Dartmouth's Cold Regions Research Labs, we were working with a group of scientists there. Ross A. Virginia, just the dean of the environmental study schools there, helped with this. We did is take all the data, plug it into different music patches, and we're able to make um, what we call a generative composition that would be mirroring weather patterns, temperature differentials, and other things. So it's called algorithmic musical transcription. And being able to take data patterns uh, and then use it to generate hip hop, techno, dubstep, it's just pattern generation and pattern recognition. So for me, at least as an artist, these are kind of my new palette. Um, if you begin to think about the 21st century art uh, kind of moving forward, your average child will be growing up with uh, the sensibility that there's a data-driven society around them, and they'll be engaging that as a basic foundation. So this is stuff that I think is very 
current, but also has a pretty good sensibility in the rear view mirror. Um, some of the other artists that I've been looking at uh, when I was working on the book is we had a series of initiatives uh, where we wanted to dimensionalize the project, and we ended up taking it to a bunch of museums. Um, it, it premiered at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and the other version of it was a multimedia symphony hosted by uh, Robert Redford at Sundance. And you went into the room, and there were all these loops of different kinds of ice melting. And depending on where you were in the room, um, basically you would get a sensibility to be hip hop or techno or so on. So you'd have to walk around in a sort of quote unquote processional space made by the uh, sort of sound waves. And so there's some fun ways to engage all of this ideas of impermanence, but still look at it from the viewpoint of contemporary art. Um, one of my other kind of uh, you know, inspirations is Yoko Ono, who's what generally considered to be a Fluxus artist from the 1950s and 60s. Um, but Yoko, um, I've produced some of her work over the years, and she has an album called Yes, I'm a Witch, <laughs> um, which I you know, helped uh, sort of produce with this material. But the pun here is that their artists um, in the 60s, like John Cage, uh, you know, Rob, you know, Merce Cunningham, Robert Rauschenberg, um, all of those were artists who actually were engaged with science. And there was a group of scientists who engaged artists uh, called Experiments in Art and Technology at the Armory uh, in New York in the 60s as well. So what do many of us think of these as what I call the silo effect, uh, where you have people who are hyper-specialized in one field and they never talk to anybody else. Um, and this is the anti-silo. So for me at least, when I was in Antarctica, I ended up setting up a series of what you call open source initiatives, and I made an album called Of Water and Ice. Um, and the whole album uh, is based on my compositions made in Antarctica, because Antarctica is the only place on Earth with no government. And uh, essentially, it's a commons, um, a creative commons, so to speak. And for me at least, uh, working with open source data, with scientists, we then put it all online and generated a series of compositions that are free downloads because, again, the idea is to encourage people to remix and sample the data. Um, so my website, that's uh, djspooky.com slash Antarctica, there's all sorts of uh, material. Um, so what I wanted to do today was show you guys some examples, uh, but this is one template, but let's get a little more current. Um, what you're seeing here is, um, I'm gonna just kind of put it out there, it's a whiteboard that was the original equations for Google Maps. Now, the gentleman who invented Google Maps is named Noel Gordon. And amusingly enough, um, he was uh, kind enough to, let's just see, Noel Gordon, I visited him at Google's headquarters and we did a series of conversations. But it was really fascinating because I was, I was kind of intrigued to see how you would get that sense of logic. Um, this is a really fun article where they were talking about everyone would go to the whiteboard and keep erasing each other's equations. Uh, while they were working on the, um, the early uh, Google Maps. And so eventually this whiteboard is not a part of Google's mythology because it just basically says A to B. I don't know if anyway. <laughs> so um, when, I, when we ended up going to his headquarters and had a long conversation, uh, what was really fun is I got a sense of being able to not only look at uh, the creative process, but to actually see how people uh, with huge amounts of resources such as Google would be able to um, kind of just think about that notion of landscape. And so Noel uh, began showing me different examples of projects that he had worked on. And it was really intriguing to see the uh, kind of layers of how data and sensibility go together. So for example, this is Apple Maps. I don't know if anyone remembers Apple Maps. That's the uh, a serious lack of data. <laughs> um, I don't know if you'd want to drive down that road, but you know, it's art, right? There we go. <laughs> um, so when I visited his studio, uh, he was, you know, I got a chance to actually see some of Google's new projects, uh, looking at, uh, for example, they're mapping underwater, the, the oceans right now, these are really interesting underwater drones, um, and so Noel was showing me how they can control drones from like a Pixel phone, a Pixel Google phone, and so on, and it was really fascinating to see, uh, he was like, okay, we got a drone right now going over the Great Barrier Reef, here, he just pulls out his phone and starts controlling the drone, and a turtle comes up and is slightly confused. Um, and meanwhile, you can see in the corner, it's like all the different Google, like Google Maps, Google Play, and so on. But um, in high definition, real time. Um, so it's really fascinating to see, again, going back to that Leonardo da Vinci, I'm going to keep referencing that idea of the ethnographic representation, um, how deeply embedded the idea of Renaissance perspective still is in almost everything we're using today. So that inspired me for yet another project. Uh, which is one of my more recent books. It's called The Imaginary App. And I, again, I publish with MIT usually. 
Uh, in this one, we interviewed um, many people who were heavily involved in the app economy. Um, and I was very interested in how apps had changed the creative process. So Noel Gordon's in it, uh, Jaron Lanier, who's a very interesting figure, who's generally considered the father of virtual reality. Um, all sorts of major theoreticians looking at the creative economy and mobile media. Um, and it's a fun book. Uh, we kept it reasonably accessible. If anybody wants to get technical, we'll talk later. We can do that. Um, but what I was fascinated with is how apps had really created this entire narrative of recursion. Um, so one could argue Facebook, Twitter, so all the main social media things, even in China, stuff like TikTok or WhatsApp, had all generated this notion that the logic is that you have to continuously engage. And so there's a recursive feedback mechanism that makes people more addicted to the actual you know, devices and software. Um, so how do you break that cycle? And that was a question we, you know, we posed to some of our authors. Um, so I tracked down other people, like this gentleman, Armin Heinrich, um, he did the first art spoof app on iTunes, and it's called <laughs> I Am Rich. Um, and don't forget, the iPhone's only been out since 2008. Um, that was the first iPhone app. Um, and he's, he just made it so that uh, it was the most expensive app on iTunes. I'll zoom in there. It's $999.99. It's art, right? you got to pay a little. Um, and what ended up happening is all these Russian oligarchs and Saudi princes and stuff started downloading these apps. <laughs> and, uh, so if you, if you saw it on someone's phone, you would know that they were rich. <laughs> so it was a sense of humor, but um, it actually started getting popular amongst very wealthy people as a conspicuous consumption. And um, Apple was not pleased, and they eventually pulled it down, and then he put it on Google Play. So um, I'm always interested in this kind of sensibility of uh, playfulness and reverence that art, again, always seems to bring to the table. Um, so that was one project, but another one uh, that I think may be of resonance for you all is that um, 2019 is the 50th anniversary of the internet. So uh, one of my inspirations for thinking about like the arts overall is systems thinking. And one of my favorite, uh, very troubled uh, person, Richard Wagner, uh, coined the term, he says, imagination creates reality. Um, and one of the main things of his sensibility in the 19th century was that he coined the term Gesamtkunstwerk, which in German simply means total artwork. Um, for me as an artist, it was really fascinating to see how that 19th century sense of lyricism uh, could inspire many scientists. Actually, quite a few people uh, generally say that um, listening to some of his work while they're working or writing actually helped them think through stuff and so on and so on. So the Ring Cycle, for example, was one of several major scientists' uh, favorite compositions, and so on and so on and so on. But what's fascinating is that obviously he was very, you know, for lack of a very problematic character, he was deeply racist, sexist, hated everybody, you know, cantankerous old white guy, you know, very, very 19th century. <laughs> but, um, at the end of the day, that sensibility still informed people like Nietzsche, who then informed other artists, and so on and so on. So for me at least, uh, Wagner's sensibility really lingers over some of our ideas about Gesamtkunst's work. So, um, I said, well, let's think that out a little more. And I got recently an award from uh, the Hewlett Foundation um, that's basically, it's celebrating um, this, uh, Henry Louis Gates, who was uh, his big champion in my work over the years at Harvard. Um, so Hewlett Foundation gave um, $8 million for artists to use data. And so basically I was the first recipient of that. And um, I said, you know, you know, let's, if you've given some resources, uh, what, what would you do for a new art project looking at data? So I like to think meta, and what I ended up doing was doing what I call an acoustic portrait of the entire internet. So, uh, what does that look like? So, this is the internet in 1969. Um, so, ARPANET. Uh, there are the two main hubs were between UCLA and Stanford Research Institute. And what I ended up doing was thinking about the law of exponential growth and how the internet had become this massive structure that's one of the most intricate and complex uh, mechanisms human beings have ever made. And how would you turn that into a composition? Uh, because obviously it's always churning and changing and there's always all sorts of you know, internet of things and other kinds of devices coming online and so on and so on. Uh, but back then there was a simple elegance to how you could look at this large scale phenomena, but from the very beginning. And again, this still comes out of the Cold War psychology I was talking about earlier, with the Sputnik and so on because it was meant to be a one hand a research tool and on the other hand a communication system if there was any conflict. So what I ended up doing was tracking down um, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Leonard Kleinbrock um, and asked him to um, help narrate the project. Now, if anyone's, a, I'm a big fan of Werner Herzog, so we um, engaged his, some of his footage. 
Um, and Werner uh, did a piece about Leonard Kleinrock, uh, which was called Lo and Behold, and it was about the beginnings of the internet. So I'll just play you a quick clip, and um, then you'll we'll see what I mean. We've just entered a historic site here at UCLA. This location is where the internet began, and it began that piece of equipment. That's the first piece of equipment ever put on the internet. It's what you call a router today. This is 1969. In October of 1969, we had this first switch here at UCLA, and by October, we had the second switch up at Stanford Research Institute. The experiment we wanted to perform was to send a message up to SRI. Now, what kind of a message should we send? A really good one, like Armstrong from the moon, he said, a giant thing for mankind. Or Samuel Morse, what our God was. Or Alexander Graham Bell, come here, watch and I need you. Those guys were smart. They understood public relations in media. We were nerds. We didn't have a message prepared. All we wanted to do was log in from here to SRI. To do that, you have to type L-O-G. And that machine will type the I-N. So we're ready to go. Type the L to get the L, type the L. Type the O, get the O, type the O. Type the G, get the G, crash. The SRI machine crashed. So, the first message ever on the internet by accident was Mo, as in, lo and behold. We couldn't have asked for more prophetic, more powerful, more succinct message than that. So here we are years later, and this machine and that message launched what we now call the internet. This is Len Kleinrock at UCLA. And here we see the first router, the first piece of equipment of the internet ever. Let's look inside. This machine is so ugly, it's beautiful. <laughs> there it is, technology from 1969. This is the machine that launched the internet. So I'd like to welcome you tonight to DJ Spooky's Entertainment. All right, so it was a real pleasure working with him, and we got um, basically a sensibility of how um, sort of the large-scale structures of you know, the law of exponential growth would be able to affect the evolution of the internet. So um, this is one of the concert uh, pieces. It's going to be touring. Uh, there's going to be an exhibition at the Whitney Museum um, around October 29th, which is when the first message was sent in 1969. So we're going to have a, a big happening at the Whitney Museum in New York. You guys are all invited. Um, <laughs> And basically, so when you start to going from, like, for example, this, the, these early two hubs with small spokes, going to a VR symphony where I'm able to control, that's uh, me wearing all this VR equipment, and I'm controlling a string quartet, and I had the San Francisco Girls Corps singing the early binary code of the, uh, the internet at that time. So they're just a, a chorus of young women saying zero, one, zero, zero. And um, so I'm sampling them and then rerouting it to, um, so you can see these smaller hubs connecting, and then the string quartet is being able to play the data sonification I'm grabbing with the VR gloves. And you know, it was, we had this premiere in San Francisco. Many people from the sort of Palo Alto community came out, um, and it's you know, it's a multimedia kind of concert, but again, based mainly on data sonification and the arts and the intersection of art science and, and data science, really. So. Uh, eventually, you start seeing these huge volumes of different networks and nodes, and the, the women are, they, regretfully, they're all wearing black, but they're kind of sil silhouetted against all the hubs and nodes of the internet, and the string ensemble is still playing, and I'm sampling them uh, through the software. Um, so this was an art initiative. It's going to be going to museums and galleries, uh, because this year is 2019, so uh, maybe it'll come here next year, we'll see. But we're in the middle of um, kind of looking at a series of these initiatives, about the intersection of data and arts. Um, in fact, my next project after this, which I don't have any images yet, uh, because it ha we're just beginning, um, is I'm going to be composer in residence with Google Arts and Culture, which is a new uh, foundation that Google has to encourage artists to use data. Um, and I'll be going to Timbuktu uh, in a little bit, um, because Timbuktu is where some of the oldest libraries in Africa are, and um, I'll be going there this summer. So if you stay tuned uh, next year, the next CSPO, I'll, I'll have some images from me in Timbuktu. Um, but at least for 2019, this is the current uh, project looking at data and sound. Um, and what's fascinating is how we look at the arts right now is so bizarre. Uh, I mean, this is a friend of mine's project it's in, um, uh, for Burning Man, for example. He cut an entire 747 jet and made it become a club. You know? So that's, that's like, you gotta have, normally I'd be DJing, I'd be like lasers. So that's a, you guys are getting an art mix. 
Um, but generally, when I'm doing these kinds of projects, there's a component where I will try as much as possible to work with scientists and to work with people um, who are involved with the, you know, the sort of anti-silo approach. Um, so let's see. I've shown you Book of Ice. I've shown you the Imaginary App. Um, and this, is, this project is called Quantopia, which simply means uh, quantified utopia. Um, and it's a series of puns and that evolves into this large-scale uh, symphonic work. But there are other pieces where I've worked with um, people a little bit more in the traditional forms of music. Um, for example, this is a project I did in Korea a little while ago where this is one of the oldest noise compositions in the world. Uh, it's, it was written in homage to Emperor Qin, the founding emperor of China. And what's fascinating is that uh, a Chinese musician today could still read it because the symbols are mathematical and they're where you place your fingers on the guzheng. So, of course, with me being me, I track down an app developer who makes a digital guzheng. And was able to try and figure out how we would take these more traditional ancient methods and transcribe them into digital media. So I worked with a, um, this is me an ensemble in uh, Korea uh, at the, uh, the Seoul Institute of the Arts. And I ended up having them transcribe some of that into electronic music. And we also worked with, um, this is uh, my ensemble, the place traditional, these are called court instruments, the hegum. Um, and the Koreans and uh, Chinese and Japanese have a similar group of tuning systems still based on that mathematical structure. But I, like I said earlier, much of my work is about globalization and moving between many cultures and doing a lot of research to make those projects uh, evolve. So, Hopefully, uh, today, what I've given you guys is a whole series of projects. Um, there's a lot more. Um, most of my books are all on my website, but um, many of the issues that I'm thinking about are this kind of playful irreverence. So say, for example, with Armin Heinrich, when we tracked down his app um, and found that it had been pulled down, what we ended up doing was doing an open call for many artists to do what we call sort of apps, for covers for apps that didn't exist, um, because that was meant to go with the book, the imaginary app. And it was really fun. Thousands of people submitted artwork, and we eventually had a touring gallery show of all these arts uh, pieces made uh, from apps uh, that were, of course, supposed to not exist. Um, but in the process of writing a book before that, I discovered um, this gentleman who, hopefully, if you guys don't know, um, you should. His name is Alex Steinwitz. And generally, he's considered to be the inventor of the record cover sleeve. So again, this is graphics and design. Uh, but implicit in modern mass media. Uh, what ended up happening is in the 1920s, if you went to a record store, a record would be blank. You'd just get a gray sleeve. So one day he went to Columbia Records and said, why don't we put an image on the sleeve to give people a sense of what it sounds like? So generally he invented the record cover sleeve, which one could you know, argue to change the course of visual literacy of the entire 20th century. So this is generally considered to be the first record cover sleeve. Um, Columbia Records, it's already a collage. You can see that there's a record and the marquee from Times Square. Um, but what's fascinating is if you think about graphic design and uh, people like Steve Jobs who have developed a very specific relationship to um, tactile media and the use of screens and other kinds of materials, you can easily see if we leap out and go into apps, you can see the same logic still at work. So um, they're going from analog to digital. It doesn't mean there's a loss of literacy. It just means there's just transference and a translation. Um, and to me, at least, um, Alex Steinweiss, um, we did one of the last, I did the last interview with him before he passed away uh, for my book, uh, Sound Unbound for my Tea. So um, all of these are projects that um, are kind of placeholders between when I'm working on other things. But in general, I try as much as possible to keep an active process going. Um, and that's something that is critical in this time when the media and everything is changing so rapidly. Um, there's one or two other projects that I would love to show because I always think that it's good to give people a sensibility of an overview. Uh, one of which, you know, kind of might be slightly more on the political side of things, but that's, uh, I'm political, sorry. Uh, so, oops, I just clicked on that, for example. <laughs> um, <you know. laughs> So, um, yeah, I began this discussion with Gerpetomania, uh, which is this idea that, of why would slaves want to run away from the plantation, uh, which I thought was always amusing, but that was part of the project where I was doing a series of films where I helped executive produce, um, it's a five DVD box set called Pioneers of African American Cinema, where we had the first directors, uh, you know, African American directors who worked with Library of Congress, 
But that was an antidote to a project by um, D.W. Griffith called Birth of a Nation. And I got the rights to Birth of a Nation, remastered it, and then re-scored it. And we made it, I had Kronos Quartet play that. Um, so Kronos Quartet's a legendary ensemble. Um, and we eventually had a series of these concerts where I was sort of playing, uh, had Kronos Quartet play that I was sampling with hip hop and electronic music. Um, this one is not scientific like at all. It's just, you know, like slavery plantations and people, white people in blackface, sorry, it's not. I know this is a science conference, but slight tangents are always good, there we go. Um, but we ended up having this play and premiere at um, one of my, the world's like wildest spots, which is the Acropolis. Um, and so what ended up happening is we were in negotiations um, and the Greek government was like, but why do you want to play a KKK film at the Acropolis? <laughs> and um, so I was like, well, you guys are Greek, you know, you get comedy, tragedy, and I'm not. So um, the day that, of the concert, you know, just a little hip hop moment here, it was really fun. We got them to put a huge sound system throughout the ruins. And we had about 5,000 people come to the show. And the first, this is the Herod Atticus Theater at the base of the Acropolis. And uh, it was an amazing evening, and so about 5,000 people come out. And I said, hey everybody, uh, thanks for coming to the concert. I think I'm the first DJ to play here in like 3,000 years. <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks for coming to the show. Um, but what was beautiful about it was this sense of symmetry and proportion that they had engaged in that era. You know, in Pythagoras, uh, you know, Socrates, all these people had thought about the tuning of a society. Um, you know, and there's a whole system of in place if you walk around where you can hear someone whisper because the theater, the acoustics, again, the science of, of sound, um, the acoustics were set up for an unamplified voice to be heard. And you can easily hear um, if someone would be wearing a mask, like a tragedy or a comedy, they would be able to be heard by the entire audience because the sound at that time was this is a semicircle ring that reflects the sound back. Again, very specific acoustic science there. Uh, but we could have, I had to put in hyper bass sound system, so uh, it was a pretty fun show. So, uh, with that said and done, um, I did want to leave some time for questions. But before we actually wrap up, I do want to say uh, many of the projects uh, that I engage are always kind of meant to be a conversation about potentiality. And one of my favorite uh, friends and supporters is a gentleman by the name of Ai Weiwei, who, if you don't know his work, he's a great guy. Um, he's been a big supporter of my work over the years. But we always have had a series of conversations about what he's experienced with oppression in China uh, based on uh, the fact that he was an artist who worked with a tremendous amount of political activity around pushing the Chinese government to recognize the arts in a different way. Um, and here in the US, where perhaps there's other systems that create other kinds of problems. So um, people like him or Yoko Ono are big inspirations to me. Um, as much as people like, I don't know, Vandana Shiva, if you don't know her work, she's an eco-activist, uh, and she's been a very big advocate for planting trees around in India and really engaging the uh, mechanisms of rural agrarian cultures to fight back against like Monsanto and the genetic uh, blocking of seeds in India, for example. So um, I very much like to try and work with people across different cultures. And um, yeah, by way of finishing that, um, I do want to say it's a real pleasure to hear your president earlier today. And like I said, I um, just want to show you something really I think you'll find kind of fun. Um, usually there would be like thousands of people. This is DJing like a little while ago. There's all these, you know, wild, wild uh, young women throwing their bras on stage. Oh, they did that. That's me DJing. Um, but yeah, that's with like lasers and, and the crowd is jumping. So you guys are getting the art mix. So um, <laughs> just, just keep that in mind. Um, so with that said and done, um, I do want to say just thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Cynthia, Dave, Dan. Um, and this has been a non-linear engagement with interdisciplinary uh, arts and thinking about the role of the composer, the artist, and the scientist. So thank you. To leave some time for questions, which I'm um, happy to do. So. Thanks for a really great talk and very visually compelling. Uh, so, my question is about how you um, manage being in this kind of liminal space where it seems like, on one hand, you're sort of critical about the attention economy, and on, on the other hand, you're deeply engaged with technology and, you know, with Google and um, I'm just wondering how you balance that, um, and if you have 
you know, tips for people who also see like the the costs that can potentially be there, but also the benefits from technology? How do you live in that space? That's a great question. Um, the eerie thing right now, and I keep using that word eerie because it, it, it's almost like the term uncanny has been overplayed. There's yeah. so much, we're in an uncanny time at every level. Um, you know, it's navigating the, there, this is the strangest time of human history. I mean, there's no question that um, we live in a data-driven society, that most people are not necessarily engaged with the technology around them in a way that actively, you know, like lets them get under the hood, so to speak. So there's this kind of surfing on the surface of things. And um, so I'm trying to figure out, from my own perspective, you know, just how do you uh, play with history and play with the present in a way that allows the future to breathe a little more? Um, and when you see so many kids engage with social media and so on, that's radically changed their perspective and narrowed their sense of choices. That's my, my own take on it. And I'm happy to, to get into a debate about that. But um, so. There is no necessarily silver bullets per se. It's more a matter of using the tools at hand. Um, and I, I played Dungeons and Dragons in the, in the 80s. You know, I don't know they, that gave me some tools when I was a kid. <laughs> um, but generally, I've never, I've always had a sense of irreverence, and uh, I'm not really um, keen to lock into any one particular thing. So I've, I've been sort of nomadic uh, with my aesthetic. But I'll, I'll, I will show you one example of when a controversy that became amusingly twisted. Um, I, I remixed this weird thing on the, online and changed the font to say explain the difference. So the white woman on the left with the M16 versus the uh, Arabic woman on the right with the uh, AK-47. Um, the white woman on the right forwarded this to a whole bunch of gun enthusiasts on Twitter. And um, I was hiking in India near Varanasi where the Buddha was born. Um, and my phone started going crazy. That's some of my photography dealing with uh, the, the Ganges River is sinking, and you can regretfully, this is a stunningly beautiful area, but the water should be higher. Um, you can see where the brown is, that's where the water should be, but the Ganges River is dying because all the glacier fields. Anyway, this is a product of National Geographic. My phone starts ringing and uh, getting huge amounts of alerts and messages popping up, and um, I was like, what the hell is going on? You know, I'm hanging out with like cool Indian musicians and like a nice area. Um, and my phone kept going crazy, so I finally turned off all alerts, and I was taking a tuk-tuk. Um, and, um, yeah, so I was from friends of mine, Paul, all these gun nuts online are going crazy at you for this, uh, that thing you posted. And I was like, what, this? And so the, the white woman was like, DJ Spooky, damn you, I got some guns for you when you come. I see that you're in India. And, um, and I was like, okay, you know. Uh, the Arab woman never got in touch. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but all these gun nuts were like tweeting at me and like getting like death threats and like crazy. I didn't delete it. It's a, it's quite intriguing to uh, get even bots and like you know, what you call computational propaganda and other stuff. Um, so my my Twitter address had been forwarded to all these weird gun and like right wing forums and was just going viral because this image. I guess the remix was just the font. There's another version, but this is my remix and I posted it and she had seen it and then forwarded it and then right wing lunatics. They're very vocal and active. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was doing a project in India about the, the Ganges River and like data of like water pollution, and um, that was one of the more you know like hanging out with very relaxed, pleasant Indian folks, and um, you know just that was one of the more paradoxical moments. Like here you are in a incredible fist of humanity, and like right wing toxic people are using social media to kind of go insane at you. Um, that one, I, one day I'll probably turn that into an art project. <laughs> but um, me and I'd rather hang on with them. But um, I saw someone else had their hands too. Sorry if that was, I hope that answered the question. A little bit of storytelling. Yeah, so I'm curious about the relationship between the technology and the So just going back to your initial, the poster of the, the uh, uh, turning the desire to be free into psychosis, um, it <clears throat> makes me think a lot about neuroscience today. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just wondering what you're doing in that space because there's a lot that seems very uh, reminiscent uh, as in, instead of it being a, a psychosis now, it's just uh, neurochemistry. Yeah, I mean, that's a great um, point. Well. Um, Right now, I'm a big fan of the term neuroplasticity and the fact that everyone can 
can change and transform uh, as they get better and more robust information, which is probably makes me an optimist. Um, but I've been working out a series of initiatives um, that I would say a bit about neuroscience per se, but I've worked with um, looking at this idea of the 50th anniversary of the internet, and we're gonna be, part of that was I was artist in residence, I'm a fellow at Stanford, and a William Gates fellow, um, and we, they have the William Gates Center for Computational Arts, which is pretty interesting. Um, and I go in there occasionally and work to just have these series of debates and discussions with data scientists about the, the mind and sort of computational narrative, which, which is fascinating. And I'm using a, part of that in my next book as a chapter, uh, just looking at computational narrative and the way uh, rage, anger, other kinds of forms of <coughs> emotional intensity translates into like rage tweeting or there's even psychologists who have studied Trump's tweets at seven in the morning, and, like his grammar is bizarre and all this stuff. Um, and there's a book called Duty to Serve about a group of psychoanalysts who study Trump um, uh, for narcissistic personality disorder. Um, I mean, yeah, we live in an era where the president himself is basically a, a, a Twitter bot. You know, so um, it's, yeah, it's very postmodern. <laughs> um, but just on a slightly lighter note, um, there are people who are scientists looking at data and narrative who I've worked with over the years. This is Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Um, generally, he's considered to be the person who wrote the first source code for the first web page in 1989. And so these are some of his issues around what he called the semantic web. Um, so looking at uh, how we weight language mathematically and forms like uh, code of HTML, uh, C++, and so on, JavaScript. Have, have translated into this entire ecosystem. Um, and it was fascinating to see his perspective about language and semiotic theory, because he wrote uh, the first source codes for this at um, CERN in Switzerland. Um, and it was fascinating because he did that as an open source initiative because it was in a public forum, whereas if he had done it in a more private corporate thing, one could argue the web is the largest transfer of wealth in human history. Um, and you know, there's a lot of studies that show uh, different aesthetic approaches to how People look at uh, cognitive capitalism, which is another issue going back to your sort of neuro uh, kind of science approach. I'm, I'm, if you ask me the same question after the summer when I'm done with the book, I'll probably have a better answer. <laughs> the book's called Digital Fiction, The Future of Storytelling. Okay. 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 Uh, so thank you very much. I really enjoyed your talk. I enjoyed the, the like, subtle repetition and also non-linearity. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering, like, you were really generous um, in like how you were inspired by all of these different people and experiences that you had, but your also your experiences themselves and the collection of them and your processing of them is so unique. I'm wondering how you've observed how you have affected the people that you interacted, in particular, since we are a gathering of scientists, uh, uh, the scientists that you have interacted with. How has interacting with you changed the way that you? Okay. Um, scientists are amazing. I mean, there's, I think, the passion and dedication and sense of diligence they have and bring to um, anything is really uh, just awe-inspiring. As an artist, most artists, it's like herding quantum cats, like they're jumping around. <laughs> and everyone's, you know, kind of, if you put five art artists in a room, they're all going to have a different, you know, kind of universe going. Um, and if you put five scientists in a room, they'll each have some, you know, different approach to that universe or something. But when you mix them all together, it's actually much more intriguing for me is just to kind of look at the mix as this sort of sort of kaleidoscope of all these different approaches and possibilities. Um, so with, when I interact with scientists, it's always what I call the, a dialectical process, like conversations, questions, and a fearless sense of being able to say, look, I'm, I'm reading up on that. I'm not a specialist at all, but I read a lot. So if you give me uh, some theories and topics that you know I can circle back to for our next round of conversation. Like that's what I ended up doing at Dartmouth because uh, I was a fellow there, and um, you know the, the Cold Reasons Research Lab is generally considered one of the best in the world. And so those guys are serious number crunchers. Um, I also ended up working with the Newcomb uh, Institute of Complex Mathematics at, at Dartmouth as well, and these are serious, world-class mathematicians. But you know we could easily talk about pattern recognition and like hip hop or something like that which, again, you would not normally expect. Um, but it actually you know, was really uh, a treat to see when people get comfortable, a good conversation can lead everyone down different paths. In fact, 
that just reminds me, there was one image I was going to start the whole discussion with, but it's not, considering we're, we're not linear here. Um, one of my favorite conversations of all time is a kind of a debate slash discussion between um, two figures who I think were just super influential in my thinking as well, which is Einstein and Rabbi Jat Tagore. Um, they met backstage at the Nobel Awards uh, because Einstein just won for his general theory of relativity. And Rabbi Jat Tagore uh, is the first Indian poet uh, to win the Nobel Award as, as well. And so they're backstage and they've got along. And um, Einstein's like, you know, I'm working on this thing called the general theory of relativity. <laughs> and I, whenever he gets a writer's block, he wants to go play violin. Uh, he was actually a very talented musician, um, hobbyist, but still talented. And Rabbi Jat Tagore is like, you know, the problem with all you Europeans, your math didn't have zero and, and, until like Fibonacci. And um, in India, we had zero for thousands of years. You know, you, you guys got to get with it. So they eventually uh, went back and forth and back and forth. It was a good conversation. And then they decided to record it and make a book called On the Nature of Reality. It's a really interesting book between a, a physics person and a you know, really interesting poet. Um, and so the, those kind of conversations really open different dimensions in the, in the what is possible. And I think right now, after the 20th century silo effect, where everyone was so specialized, um, these kind of conversations to me are a big inspiration. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, so I was, I was, when you were talking about art being this um, space for sort of potentiality, that struck me, because I often think about art, particularly abstract art, as being almost these placeholders for us. You know, like looking into the future and these things that we can't necessarily wrap our heads around and having held there so that one day we can kind of enter into this space. And so I was also really struck that about thinking about taking something as complex as the internet, turning it into sound, and allowing it to be something we can, we can digest. And so I wonder if you're thinking about ways that we can take other sort of complex issues like climate change, economic inequity, um, food resources and think about ways that we can kind of take these complex issues and convert them into something we can kind of wrap our head, heads around in a way that we also don't feel so overwhelmed by these problems that we're facing. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of get your ideas on that. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, I think you'll be seeing a wave of composers and artists looking at data and mathematics and complexity theory or what we call emergent complexity, um, especially with the artificial intelligence, for example. Um, as new the new palette, um, and one could argue right now that it's still a little bit uh, in beta. Um, I've been working on projects looking at data and sound for a while, so I have a little bit of um, lead time on that. But I'm sure younger composers and artists are definitely. Uh, I'm 48, so I'm grandpa here at the moment. So, um, but I've been seeing a lot more of that as a kind of you know medium in colleges and kids growing up with that now. 19, 20 year old kids coming up with all sorts of new. Um, so, um, on the other hand, for my own competition processes, yes, I will definitely be doing more about uh, climate stuff because I've, I work pretty extensively with National Geographic, and I'm going to, uh, the Timbuktu project is going to be looking at both the expansion of the desert, uh, because this, the Sahel uh, desert is expanding because of all this climate and stuff that's happening with the equator and those sort of areas, you know, weather patterns getting radical disruption, but also that sparks uh, geopolitical conflict and fundamentalism and, other forms of uh, sort of a political response to climate change. So um, social justice issues, for example, I have done one or two projects with the Brooklyn Youth Chorus where I had them sing prison statistics um, with a uh, libretto by Michelle Alexander. She's a, she wrote a book called The New Jim Crow. Um, and the, the piece called Quantopia is going to be touring most of this year and next year. So the year after that, um, I definitely am going to be looking at uh, computational propaganda. I'm very interested in how these kind of emotional narratives can be triggered, like for example, the anti-vaxxer movement that's been, um, there was a recent article where a young man rebelled against his mom, uh, and he went and got himself immunized to measles, even though his mom was like, you're gonna get, you're gonna get killed, and we've been seeing all this stuff on Facebook saying that you shouldn't get immunized. Uh, and so he's actually now leading a big group of young people to get immunized, because um, New York is going through a whole you know, crisis right now, um, mainly because of the computational propaganda, and no one really is quite sure who's funding or where it's all coming from, but those kind of things are really intriguing to me, and the, the sort of the politics of perception. Um, 
So, I'm, and by the way, I majored in uh, macroeconomics, philosophy, and French literature. Totally useless degree. So, <laughs> so you know, at, at Bowdoin. Yeah. So, um, yeah, when I moved to New York, the way to make a living was to DJ. So, yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, thanks. Uh, Paul, thank you very much. Okay, there's oh, one. Okay, last question. Last question, yes, thank you. It's not a question, yes, Paul. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you very much uh, for bringing man, art, and science together. Both of us have the pleasure of teaching here at large classes <coughs> in the university. The moment we throw number or equations, we lose the concentration of our students. It is, well, I wish personally, I have that skill that you have to make the science of art. But I saw one of the pictures of the ladies out there putting something on their head. Um, you know, uh, I saw uh, a spade out there. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, uh, for me, there's a particular algebra and mathematics right there. Mm -hmm. that, 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 the <laughs> I'm wondering, um, uh, I'm considering one of your projects to link that into mathematics. So, <laughs> <laughs> that. But, uh, another thing, I heard you say uh, Banarasi and Buddha. Mm -hmm. um, Buddha was actually born, but it was not the Banarasi. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, that's just what I did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, people can write whole PhD on that. I definitely, um, but Banaras, or how do you, I always, I always say Baranasi, as you. Well, well, it depends on who you talk. If you, if you talk, talk to my colleague uh, here, uh, uh, Right, right there. <laughs> <laughs> we say Banarashi. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm, in, you know, I'm an American just trying to learn. But, um, yeah, I'm a big fan. I, I've been to India many times and I've worked with a lot of different Indian artists over the years. In fact, this project was working with uh, Dita Mehta, who's um, a very renowned Indian architect. So we were looking at pollution throughout the Ganges River, uh, River Basin and then comparing different uh, pollution particulate uh, because the ganja is uh, dying because of all the glaciers melting. So that project premiered at the Rubin Museum in New York, which is a really interesting museum on the history of Buddhism. I'm not religious at all, but um, the, uh, the idea was to trace the idea how zero uh, at that time uh, affected how people thought about infinity and things like that, but then to pull that into an analysis of the current uh, kind of processes where people are looking at um, climate change, is the river is system is actually a really powerful metaphor for how society, one could argue, has these kinds of approaches. So the river in uh, India, Ravi Dutt Tagore's poetry is out all based on rivers. But it's all in Sanskrit and it's numbers. So um, in one, so Gita Mehta, we had a crew of her Columbia University graduate students uh, help, uh, and we went to India for about six weeks and we met with Indian mathematicians and. People think the river is holy, and there's all, and all sorts of amazing stuff. So the mathematics is tied to the mythology, and the mythology goes into all sorts of other tangents. Um, so that, that article and that project went to National Geographic, and I also visited some of the main temples of Hindu culture, and I even got blessed by an elephant, which was also um, pretty wild. Um, so Madurai, Chennai, um, all sorts of different cities. There's a, um, the Temple of Minakshi is where we uh, met many of the main musicians. And this is generally considered to be one, an architectural process of thinking about the earliest form of skyscraper, for example, if you're into architecture. But what's fascinating is Minakshi was the goddess of the city in Hindu mythology. So all those other gods, those you know, thousands of gods, had to kind of get remixed there. You know? And the, so the urban narrative, um, I mean, I'm not, again, I'm not religious at all, but I've, I try and be very respectful of different traditions. So we met the temple musicians of Minakshi, and then I was given, they were showing me different scales and tempos. And um, again, this is based on a lot of early Hindu mythology about the city and the river. Um, and Gita, if you, if you look Gita Mehta up, she's a very renowned Indian architect, so it was really a, a pleasure to kind of meet uh, really amazing musicians from that tradition and then see how we could do a New York versus this kind of context approach. New York's a river a city as well, so. But, um, okay, if anybody has any follow-up, I'm happy to continue, and um, every time I think about scientists, I just think, you know, God, only a couple more days to Trump's out of office. Okay. <laughs>